Welcome in everybody to the first live video here on our Project Home YouTube channel. And it's gonna be a good one for you, hopefully, if you uh, get a chance, you have some energy questions, we wanna answer them. We've got some experts here to talk with you about energy usage in your house, comfort issues, ways to improve that, things that we deal with all the time, and things that you probably uh, think about quite often, especially in the winter time. Now we know last week was super cold, it would've been a great time to do it, but we had to reschedule for various reasons. And we're glad to be back to answer some questions today and talk with you about energy usage in your home. And we'll bring people in now. We've got Philip Downs, technical supervisor here at Project Home, Adam Wisey, the field supervisor at Project Home, and Laura Paparaki from MG&E, all on with us today to talk about energy. And my name is Jason Hapen. I'm the outreach manager here at Project Home. Okay, so we got some questions uh, that were emailed to us earlier before we got into this. If you have questions, you can plug them into the live chat. I'm going to actually pop in a message there because I know on YouTube, sometimes the live chat needs to be activated with a message from the host before it starts working. So I'll do that in just a second. But we do have some questions that were submitted and we'll get into some of these. Uh, one thing that's been on a lot of people's minds and issues this winter uh, are ice dams. And so Laura, if, if we toss this to you right away, uh, Frank asks, he says, my house has problems with ice dams. What are likely the reasons for this? Yeah. Um, okay. So the very specific reasons ice dams happen are um, number one, typically the, the biggest reason is because there's warm air uh, escaping from the house up into the attic. That warm air uh, heats the underside of the roof, causes that snow and or ice to start melting. It runs down, down the roof to usually like the soffit area where like the house is no longer heated and refreezes. Um, that's the number one reason. A low, lack of, in, some lower levels of insulation can be an issue. Ventilation in the attic can also be an issue. Uh, but the number one reason is just that warm air moving up into the attic, which is remedied through an attic air sealing package. So tightening up the house. Anybody else have anything to add to that? No, that's it in a nutshell. Um, we're seeing a lot of that this year in our area, uh, just based on the snow load and the weather conditions we've been having. Um, these are issues people have probably been having for years, and uh, it's really come to light this year, given all the snow and melting that we've had. So like Laura said, air sealing is probably the biggest, uh, or lack of air sealing in the between the attic and the home is probably the biggest contributing factor to why the ice dams form. I think it's been a big thing, obviously with, like you said, the snow load, Adam, and then, and then when it got so cold, you know, for a good stretch of time, and then all of a sudden a quick warm up too, uh, all those things kind of contributing. When someone has, uh, let's say people haven't had ice dams before, and now they had ice dams this year, um, is that something in a normal winter they should be concerned about? Or, or is it something like, oh, it's just a really cold two week stretch. How often is it that cold that long if I've never experienced this before, but have experienced ice dams this winter? Philip, you got a take on that? So a lot of times the ice damming will occur, depends upon which side of the house, a lot of the times the snow will accumulate on. So that can make it either much worse for one winter versus another. But if you get ice dams, even say once every eight years, you have an issue going on in your house. So one year, correct, could be worse than others, but what you want to avoid is the major damage that can happen with that roof leak if it gets bad enough, because you may not be able to see all the damage that's happening up in the attic with moisture damage that maybe the insulation is holding. And then later on, I've seen at ceilings, drywall ceilings actually collapse down due to the weight of the water that collects in the insulation. And then it just gets the drywall wet and you may not see a problem until the whole ceiling collapse. That's more the extreme end, but that does happen. So what I like to tell people is, is if you're calling in an energy expert or someone to look at the nice damning issue, a roofer, someone like that, someone who's, or an energy expert like yourself, you wanna make sure that 
one they get in the attic and take a look and have the right tools. So I like to have an infrared camera is one of the tools of the trade that we use to help determine is there existing insulation? Maybe how much it might be there. Um, are there other wet spots? These infrared cameras find cold spots related to the other parts of the, the ceiling or the attic. And it's just getting one of the tools of trade that anybody you call in should have a tool like this, an infrared camera, used to see heat differences, hot and cold uh, on your house. You can survey the, the, the walls, the attic, things like that. So a tool like that is also critical if you're having issues, that you're calling in somebody has the equipment to really diagnose it, go up in the attic, take a look, insulation levels, air sealing, um, opportunities, things like that. So year to year, it can vary a lot and it's something to look into. Other long-term things you wanna consider is if you're having ice damming issues uh, year after year and your roof is getting older to where it needs to get replaced, that's the time to consider ice and water shield as an extra barrier when you pull off your roof to put on some extra um, protection underneath the shingles. So we'll go with that. I have a quick follow-up to Adam on that uh, about roofing and ice and water shield. You know, for a while, Adam, that last kind of three or four feet of the roof was kind of where that was installed traditionally, but now are roofing companies putting ice and water shield on the whole roof? Is that current practices? I would say that's not typical. Uh, that's not a typical roofing practice to cover the whole roof, although there are products available, membranes available where they, they do, some roofing companies will do that when asked if you have had issues in the past. The sort of the standard or to code would be, um, you know, if you have a two foot overhang on your house, you have to go one and a half times the size of that overhang. So they'd run it up three feet up the roof. So um, it's, it's pretty typical to have that on, on most buildings constructed or re-roofed within the last 25 years, maybe even 30 years. Um, but if, if it's been quite some time since you've had your roof redone, you probably don't have ice and water shield under there. Um, ice and water shield is a band-aid. You know, keep that in mind. That's not going to solve your problem. Um, that's just going to help prevent water from getting into the attic once an ice dam has formed. So that's not going to prevent ice dams, but it will give you an added layer of protection if you do have an ice damming issue. So the water is still going to go somewhere is what you're saying. <laughs> it always does. <laughs> and on top of that, what ice dams are telling you is your house is speaking to you. So there's an issue and uh, probably something you got to look into. Um, yeah, you Laura, know, one, one other quick point. Oh, go Laura, ahead, Adam. Laura mentioned two other things that, uh, that do contribute to ice dam issues. And uh, number one is going to be vent fans in your house that are not vented to the exterior. That's the same as having big air leaks between your home and your attic. If you're running a vent fan in your bathroom, <clears throat> that just vents into the attic space, every time you turn it on, you're pumping warm, moist air into your attic, which is gonna to contribute to that snow melting. And the other item that she mentioned was attic ventilation. So you want, basically the rule of thumb is you want the ambient air in that attic to be the same temperature as the outside air. Now that goes counter to what a lot of people think, but really that, that, that temperature boundary is gonna be where your insulation is placed. So you wanna go from room temperature inside the house through your insulation level. And then once you get inside the attic, you want the temperature within your attic to be the same temperature as the outside air. Then when you don't have a temperature difference across your roof, you're not gonna experience any snow melting. So ensuring that, that the vents are not blocked and plugged in your, in your soffit or on your ridge vent um, is really important. And then also um, if you don't have enough vents, making sure that you have enough venting for their attic space. And that's based on size typically. Um, but if you put more venting into an attic that hasn't had any air sealing done, you're just gonna end up pulling more house air up into the attic. So really just like, like Laura had mentioned at the, at the get-go, uh, air sealing your uh, boundary between the home and the attic is really step one in pre prevention of ice dams. Laura, I want to ask you about this because the uh, the only way to really tell what's happening and 
what where you should be making those improvements or doing that air sealing that Adam was talking about is to do an energy assessment of your home, right? And that's something that all of us here on the call have done before. Um, and it is something that can be such a valuable tool, but it, but it, it is a way to test the house, see and identify the problem areas and uh, you know, figure out exactly what to attack. So tell people a little bit more about that process because most of the times that's the first step in identifying how, what's causing the ice dams and then what work can be done to improve the situation. Yeah, I I just, I can't reiterate enough I, how much I love the fact that we have at our expense here in Wisconsin, Focus on Energy, which um, put, to, puts takes homeowners and, and puts them together with trade allies who are, you know, they're all trained, they all have the right certifications, um, you know, Focus on Energy is making sure they have continuing education. And these folks come out and they're they're trained to know how to use a blower door and an infrared camera. And so <clears throat> when you're trying to identify how tight or leaky a house is and where those leaks are, you know, we there are proven there are proven ways, acceptable ways of doing this, and and this is hiring a professional who comes in, sets up that blower door, um, which is this that large temporary uh, frame with the big fan in it, right? That fan is going to temporarily aggravate all those leaks and bypasses, which normally we don't even see. You know, most folks are just sitting in their homes thinking their windows and doors are leaky because that's what we see. But there's this whole uh, probably 75 to 80 percent of uh, additional air leakage going on that we we don't see. We really honestly don't always even feel. Um, but when you get that blower door going and you're cooling down all those uh, pathways and you get that infrared camera out, that's when the fun begins because that's when you start seeing the things that are always happening, that air movement, um, and you can see it. And then when you can see it as a temperature difference showing up on that infrared camera, it's undeniable. Like, this is where your house is leaking. This is why, you know, and these professionals know where to look. They know how to scan. They know what temperature difference to look for. And that's how you start prioritizing, Jason. So it's like, okay, yep, here's here's the places we have to hit. And for lots of homeowners, you know, this is not common knowledge. So to look at a certain part of your house and be able to guess which part is leaking is just like closing your eyes and trying to hit a bullseye, you know? So that blower door and that infrared scan, that's like the, that's like the TKO, the total knockout, right? You're just, you're going to figure it out. It's not going to be a guessing game anymore. Thanks Laura for that. That's uh, that's great. And then again, that helps people identify exactly what work can be done. And then, then it gets down to the actual weatherization work inside the attic. Philip, oftentimes we're talking to just close the nice dams because we have some questions about windows and some other things. But when we talk about that work that then would be done after being identified by the energy assessment, what types of things are, are people trying to often uh, correct? You know, where are some of these bypasses? Where's some of this air transfer happening? Yeah, so up in the attic, a lot of the air leaks are associated around the plumbing pipes that go up through the venting, uh, old chimneys, and also a lot of electrical penetrations where the electricians ran electrical wires through the uh, the walls. So um, it's fairly easy to determine all that air leakage and find out where you can and air seal it first. And then after that, if you get the whole attic air sealed, including like top plates, uh, there's a lot of tools and tricks you can use to find out where the air leaks are. But after that, you can air seal the attic, all the penetrations that go into the, the unheated areas. And after that, then you want to make sure you're adding uh, enough insulation uh, to make sure that you have about an R50 uh, to R60 level of insulation in your attic to what it can handle. Um, so again, R50 is around, so you want to see 13 to 14 inches minimum. And you, typically we use blown cellulose insulation, that's loose fill. But people also use fiberglass as well. Um, so that's some of the best things is that the loose fill insulation can get into the areas. It can be leveled out. It can be blown in. Uh, it doesn't have the gaps. A lot of times if you're putting in fiberglass rolled bats, you're going to have gaps in between the rolled fiberglass, which can again lead to more uh, or less R value. So we recommend definitely a blown in insulation. We like cellulose insulation. It does typically perform the best over uh, the whole range of the year and temperatures. And it's also easier to level out. So 
you're going to do the air sealing. You got to make sure there's some documentation. You can, and that is also resulted in the blower door leakage. So the air leakage test, you're going to have an as is, and you want to see 20, 30, 40% reduction in, in your air leakage test. That's something you can verify. That's a contractor can prove. Hey, we just need to go up in the attic and, you know, blow in insulation. No, we air sealed. We got that 25% reduction, 40% reduction. And those are numbers that we see and the jobs we perform, and then you add the insulation. So it's key things, air seal, document, see how much reduction you get, and then add the insulation at the end. And then there's also other prep items you wanna make sure that you're doing like the bathroom fans are vented out, you have proper vents for ventilation, uh, other items like that. So there you go, Jason. Adam, uh, Amy submitted a question, which I think might relate to what we just were talking about which she said, um, I looked in my attic and there's frost on the wood under my roof. Is this normal? And if not, what could be causing it? So likely that same thing, that, that air temperature difference in air leaks, right? Yeah, unfortunately it is all too normal, uh, but it's not a good thing. Uh, when you see that frost in your attic, that's uh, really it's frozen condensation. So that, that moisture came from within your home, uh, the air inside of our house this time of year is relatively moist compared to the outside air and wet air flows to dry air, just like hot air flows to cold air masses. So if you still have those leaks between your house and the attic space, that warm, wet air is gonna travel into your attic. And because the underside of the roof deck is very cold and uh, water condenses on cold surfaces when it reaches the dew point, you can get those uh, frost formation, little icicles forming off of every nail head that sticks through your roof deck. So if you pop your head up into your attic and you see frost on the underside of the roof deck, that's a pretty good indicator that you still have some amount of bypass between your house and the attic that's allowing that warm, moist air into your attic. Um, if left unchecked, obviously when you keep wetting and drying your roof deck, uh, if it's made of plywood or OSB or something like that, obviously over the years, that stuff, that material can delaminate and degrade. Um, it could rot, it could create a mold problem. So, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why you don't want that condition occurring in your home. And again, that all goes right back to air sealing properly between the house and the attic space. Um, that's going to take care of uh, that those pathways that that warm moist air is using to travel from your home into your attic space. And that all starts like, like we all talked about with uh, uh, proper energy assessment to determine where these locations are. We've already talked uh, uh, quite a bit about where some of those locations are and then uh, sealing them up really is just putting a plug in that hole. So using some expanding foam sealant, using caulks and other sealants um, to seal up those, those leaks between the house and the attic space is really key. That's the key first step uh, for almost any energy improvement in a home is making sure the air sealing is done specifically from the home into the attic space. Then you can start thinking about adding insulation or uh, some of these other measures that we're talking about. Great. We have uh, some questions about windows. You know, a lot of people... Uh, often, like Laura mentioned, think uh, their windows are the problem, and sometimes they are, and sometimes they're not. Um, you know, I think some people are curious about what, how do they know? How do they, how do they know if their windows are the problem or if there's some other problem? And then people are wondering about, you know, double pane windows, vinyl windows. What are what are kind of the? How can they identify? And how should they properly evaluate their windows? Laura, can you tell us more about that? Ooh, I love this one. Now, most people are going to want to probably be able to do this on their own. However, when you think about how much you you could you could spend on getting new windows, I would highly recommend finding an energy rater who's got a blower door and a smoke stick and an infrared camera. And this was one of my favorite things to do when I was doing energy audits because it busted so many myths that people or preconceived notions that people had about their windows. And it's the same concept, Jason. So you set up your blower door and that blower door has the capacity to, it's, it's essentially uh, creating what becomes like a 20 to 22 mile per hour wind on all sides of the house, right? So 
if you could, which we don't normally see on our homes, like in, in urban areas. But when you think about that kind of pressure coming in at the window and, it, and, and that's constantly on while the blower door is happening, and then you have somebody taking a smoke stick and what a smoke stick is, is just what it sounds like. It's, it's a tube that you can squeeze and it puffs out fake smoke. But it's, it's so incredibly helpful because what you can do is you can actually see if the window is leaking because oftentimes it's not either the window itself is not maybe the the area around it you know um behind the trim um and when you can actually have the blower door going so the 22 mile per hour wind on the outside the smoke stick you're going to be able to actually evaluate every single window and see is it completely leaking? Is it leaking a little bit just because some of the weather stripping has um, gotten old and dried out or is it not leaking at all? Um, and so that for me is was one of the uh, best ways to actually help the homeowner see with their own eyes right in front of you, right? It's not like smoke and mirrors. <laughs> um, it's, it's the smoke of the blower door. And uh, it's right there for them to be able to see so that they can evaluate, like, does that seem like a lot of air or not a lot of air? And then of course, with the uh, infrared camera, you can actually start seeing, um, you know, if seals are broken and things like that, because you can take a look at the temperature across the, the whole piece of glass. But I'm sure these, I'm sure Philip and Adam have other things to add about windows, because windows we could probably talk about for an hour or two hours, because you mentioned some other things about like, what about vinyl? What about um, composite? What about wood? You know, they all have pros and cons. Um, and so I don't know what the specific question was about, about the vinyl, but when it comes to figuring out if your windows are leaky, you know, man, I just, I love the blower door and the smokestick combo. It just, you can't make that stuff up, so. Yeah, I'll speak to next. So I'll, I'll just give an example at the house I own. Um, I have a house that was built in 1930 and it had the original windows in it when I bought it about 15 years ago. It had storm windows on it. So it had single pane wooden windows with a storm on it and they were very tight. They weren't leaking, but I decided to replace my windows because many of the old windows weren't working anymore and they also had lead paint on them. And so I also gained in terms of also the R value, the U factor of the windows, I gained some thermal comfort, but for my situation, I wanted to get rid of the lead paint hazard that was on my windows and have windows that actually had two sashes that could both you know, lower the upper sash or raise the lower one. So for me, it was just more of a practicality. The windows were perfectly fine for the most part. I mean, some were broken, things like that worked well, they could have been repaired, but just replacing them to a vinyl that didn't have any mold on them, I could clean them up for a vinyl window was my preference. The wood windows was, the wood was mostly good, a little bit of mold here and there, but um, that was just my experience. It's going with replacing vinyl windows that are very efficient. They're still, I have mine are again about 12 years old now. They're working great. So I would also say if you're looking at going to a, a vinyl window or a composite window, look for a little bit more of the history on the window. See if you can talk to someone who has them installed and then see how they function after a couple of years, things like that. So that's just my two cents on the windows I had replaced in my house. There's lots of different reasons to replace windows. Um, make sure that you're kind of thinking of all these considerations. Yeah, thanks, Philip. I have a, my own personal story. Actually, the first house we ever bought, I'll tell this quick story because it was enlightening to, and it was before I worked at Project Home and understood some of the some things we're talking about, weatherizing and how insulation and air sealing works together on things. But it was a 1920s house. Uh, we bought it. We knew it had new windows installed just a year or two before we bought the place. We got in there and, and it was really drafty and really cold. So started looking at the windows and we're thinking, why would these windows be a problem? They're new. Um, and then we found that around the windows, when they were installed, there wasn't any foam or air sealing or anything done. They just kind of, the installer just stuffed a little bit of fiberglass in the gap between the window and its framing and then covered that up with, you know, the interior trim. Well, so there was air leaking around the windows um, and we kind of embarked on this little project to try to tackle that uh, and sealing around those windows to fix the issue. And it helps some, little did we know that there were also no insulation in the walls 
And those walls were also very drafty, but um, those were practices for a while. So depending on when your newer windows were installed, maybe people weren't using foam sealant at that point. Not all contractors were. The windows might be fine, but it's actually kind of air leaking around the window itself. And those are steps that, that could be done for improvement. You know, Jason, you bring up a really good point about uh, the install of the window and also the wall cavities adjacent to the window. So when you look at the actual surface area of your home that's covered by windows, um, it's, it's maybe tops 15, maybe 20% on, on some houses. Um, so if you're gonna spend so much money on new windows to improve 15 or 20% of your wall area versus spending a separate amount of money to have all your wall cavities insulated and address the other 75 or 80% or 85% of your wall surface area. Um, you can usually get more bang for your buck by making sure your walls are insulated. And like you talked about, um, you know, identify where that air leakage is actually coming from. Is it through the window unit itself or from behind the trim around the window? And like Laura mentioned, when, you know, if you have the opportunity to have an energy assessment performed, and if the, the energy professional has a blower door set up with an infrared camera, you'll be able to see where that layer is coming in. More often than not, um, when I do assessments, we find that, in fact, the window unit itself is fairly tight. It's oftentimes air leakage coming out from behind the trim. And uh, then we can start to have that discussion about how we want to attack that, as opposed to, you know, putting a whole new window unit in. So you bring up some good points. Yeah, it was a learning process for sure. And some surprises along the way. And there's, again, while, you know, we do evaluations at Project Home, there are other focus on energy approved trade allies that do them. Uh, Laura's done a bunch of them, but those are really the only way that you can see what you can't see, um, you know, with the infrared camera and getting air movement with the blower door and kind of evaluating a house like that to really truly identify if your windows are the issue or not. And so, you know, that's why we kind of all start with that as the main hub is get that energy assessment done and see. Uh, so you can properly evaluate what's needed to help with your comfort issues or your energy usage issues, and then appropriately spend your money on what's going to give you the best impact. So that's kind of what we're all about. Um, I did want to ask one other quick question, Adam, about windows, because we had some, uh, especially during the extreme cold temperatures, then, we're, then we'll move on from windows because we could talk about them for an hour. Um, but with extremely cold temperatures, Adam, you know, some people had frost building up on the glass of their windows or in the corners of the windows. Um, to what extent is that normal, especially in the, the climate and what we just went through weather-wise? Yeah, I mean, given the extreme temperatures, I'd say in our climate, that's fairly normal. Um, as long as it's not persistent and excessive, um, you know, that, that condensation, again, is a function of moisture content and surface temperature. That surface temperature on the window is reaching the dew point or lower. So any excess moisture in the air in your house is gonna condense on that surface. So again, if you leave that unchecked, that could lead to problems with, you know, deteriorating the trim and uh, windowsill around your window. Um, you could get a little uh, mildew or mold growth on the, on the window unit itself. Um, so if you do have that issue of condensation on your windows, you know, really being kind of an active homeowner and making sure that your window coverings are opened up during the daytime to allow room air, as much room air as possible to touch that window surface and keep it warm and dry. Uh, that's going to be important. Um, addressing, you know, your ventilation issues in your home to make sure you don't have too much moisture in your house, uh, making sure that you're running your bathroom exhaust fans and your kitchen range hood. If you're boiling water, make sure you're running that to uh, if you take a shower, make sure you're running your ventilation fan for a good 20 minutes to a half hour after you exit the bathroom. We just want to get all that excess moisture out of the house right at the point where you're producing it before it has a chance to diffuse throughout the house and create issues like condensation on the windows or things that you probably aren't seeing. If you have cold spots on your wall, you can be getting condensation on your walls, which causes stains and potentially uh, mold or mildew spots on your walls. Uh, as well. So something to keep in mind. I want to ask Laura a quick follow up on that because we had a question related to ventilation and usage of it. Uh, you know, Patrick asked, people have told me to make sure I'm running my bath fan during and after showers, uh, but that means I'm sucking heated air out of my house. Is this just a necessary trade off? 
Laura, what would you say about that? Yeah, I want to go back really quick to say two okay, things yeah. about the window thing. Two things, because people, they're really simple. Number one is if you can take your screens off. So if you have interior screens, take your screens off in the winter, okay? Because you don't need them. And that allows the warm house air to get to the window and warm it up. And then if, it, and like Adam said, make sure you get like blinds and stuff away from the windows at night. Like if, if it's a room where you don't, you know, you know, you're not sleeping, so you don't care so much about privacy during the night, then actually move those blinds and the curtains away from the windows. And if you really have an issue and you have a ceiling fan, let the ceiling fan go on low just so that the air circulates a bit more in that room. Sometimes just that little additional circulation, like shut, like getting forced over by the window will actually keep that moisture level down by the window. So those are two simple, simple things like that people can do. So take the screens off if they're interior, just get that warm air to the window. Okay. Thank um, you, Laura. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Uh, okay. So running the bathroom. Yes. I mean, Focus on energy, you know, is our state is our state's energy efficiency program and we've got so many smart people working for that program and lots of people crunching numbers and running software and then just doing really awesome practical in field um, tests and one of the things that we always found when no matter whether we were crunching the numbers or actually measuring the energy, you know, the, the fans using and then calculating how much air is moving out of the house. It's always more efficient to run the bath fan to get that warm moist air out and create uh, a healthy indoor indoor air environment because you're forcing that air turnover than all of the the non-beneficial things that could happen so like the mold the mildew the stagnant air um it it, it is a trade-off but and it is a necessary trade-off um because yes, it's gonna cost you a little bit, but by far it's not gonna cost you as much if it can stop an issue from happening. And maybe that's even just a small mold and mildew issue, or maybe it's a bigger issue, which is just introducing more a, a fresh, a better indoor air environment for, for that homeowner. So yes, I know it seems counterintuitive. Why am I heating air and then purposely throwing it out of the house? But we have to remember that we do want some amount of air movement, air turnover in homes. And unless unless you're going to buy an air to air exchanger, which is kind of like that next step up from running your bath fan, then that's that's it. The bath fans it, baby. You got you got to run the fan. Yeah. So that's a great, great point, Laura. Yeah. So, yeah, great point. So. A lot of times we'll see an energy auditing, I also have lots of great equipment that can test how much airflow is going through. But I'm gonna show you a real simple thing that any homeowner can use. It's a piece of toilet paper or a piece of Kleenex. And this works to demonstrate, if, if you need a little step ladder or a chair, you put this up to the vent, the bathroom vent. And if it cannot hold this piece of paper up to the vent, it's not flowing any air or so little that it's not really doing anything. So you don't need all this expensive equipment. If it can't hold this piece of paper up on the vent grill, you having a fan that it sounds like it's running and spinning, but it's blocked. And we find a lot of times fans are blocked due to bird's nests, squirrels, the venting collapse in itself, or the fan's just so old and dirty, it doesn't flow any air. So tip the trick, you don't need necessarily all this stuff to determine why is there some moisture buildup? Use this sheet, piece of toilet paper, it works great. I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Philip. Yeah, um, Laura, one other thing we often find too is sometimes those bath fans, the venting on them is, is not done properly or it's been restricted. Like Philip says, maybe outside sometimes in the attic, like maybe someone did some attic insulation work and accidentally disrupted that fan vent in the process, didn't realize it. Now the fan's not venting the same way it was. so. There's all kinds of reasons to, to make sure that that fan is actually venting the outside that's working because it's so important, especially during the winter time. Yeah, absolutely. Do you want me to talk more about that? Give us a little bit about one of your fan stories. What kind of oh. situation did you find a fan in that you were oh. just shocked by? Well, there's, there's tons of them. I mean, there's so many times I've been up in attics, even in brand new construction. So I didn't do energy audits just for existing homes. I would get to go up in brand new homes 
where the subs just went through, right? This is your brand new sparkly four to $500,000 home. Everything's supposed to be done perfect. Oh, but good thing you actually hired the energy auditor who climbs up into the attic because all it takes is one, one sub, one good hearted sub there due to, to do their job who accidentally kicks kicks the the vent, you know, the venting, right? The flex duct. Um, or even just uh, it gets turned a little bit too much. Um, there's just the, or or the tape. Okay, so he oh, oh, this is an even better one. The factories used to actually include, um, well, they still do now, but there's a little internal damper inside inside the bath fan, right? Uh, where where the where where you take the duct work and you connect it to the actual bath fan housing. Well, something as simple as when the installer was to screw on the duct work, if they were going to do that, if if that screw went just a quarter of an inch too far, that little pe that little duct, uh, that little duct flapper, that little damper would get stuck. So your duct work could be perfect, your fan could be perfect, but guess what? A half inch screw go just a little bit too far is going to stop that internal damper and suddenly you have a fan that's not working. And the list goes on and on. I mean, new construction, the birds love, love duct runs. And, and so if, if they're, if they, if there's any chance for them to go in there and make a nest, they will. Um, uh, even the tape, even sometimes, even the, when if they're taping but not screwing screwing on it, they're just taping the the flex stuck on there. You know what you're supposed to do, but nobody does it is actually take isopropyl alcohol and you're supposed to wipe that so that the connection is clean, right? Because sometimes that tapes tapes on there for the first couple of weeks, but then it can it can come off. Um, so there's just a myriad of things. That's why checking those bath fans and making sure they're actually flowing and then also making sure that that duct work is not only connected at the fan, but then actually gets to the outside of the attic is so important. And all these things, I mean, who wants to think about these things? Nobody. So I'm really glad that there's people like us who for some strange reason have this passion because we're here. We're here for people. Um, this is what we love to do. We love to make sure that house is functioning as a system. System. And for some some weird, strange reason, it just makes my heart swell. You know, it's like, yes, everything that was put in is functioning the way it's supposed to. So guess what? This house is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And, and the homeowner doesn't have to think about it. They can think about, you know, what they want for dinner or where they're going to go on vacation because they've been in their house for a year. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, animal disruption can be a key factor too. even in existing attics, if animals get in there, if there's some sort of, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of things that can happen with that venting. So it is really important. So Adam, if someone doesn't want to have a way to test their fans or see, you know, they're, they're not going to get up in the attic and dig through insulation and look for all that stuff to see if the venting is connected. How is a simpler way that they might have an indication that those fans are actually working properly if they just look at the outside of their homes? Where can they find those things to identify that if the fan's actually working and venting to the outside? Yeah, um, so those fans are gonna terminate at either a wall fitting that kind of looks like a dryer vent with little louvers on it uh, or a roof deck fitting that has a little damper, a little metal flap on it. So if you turn your fans on and then uh, go outside and look for where the fan exits the building, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that those louvers and dampers are actually opening up, allowing air to exit the vent system. Um, so that's one simple way to make sure there's actually air flowing through the system. Then when you turn the fan off, check them again, make sure they fall closed so that uh, pests and animals can't get inside that vent system. That's gonna be really important. And like Philip talked about, that sort of really easy qualitative check of holding a piece of tissue up to the fan grill to make sure that it, uh, that it has enough suction to hold that tissue onto the grill uh, is just a good good way of checking to see that the fan's actually working and exhausting air from your house and not just uh, creating some sort of cover noise. <clears throat> One other thing too, if your fans vent out the roof this time of year, uh, if you have some snow melting in that area, that's a good indication that it's working right. And um, same thing with your dryers too. I had a big pile of snow right near my dryer hood and then it all melted. Told me my dryer hood was working well. So those are good indicators this time of year for you that it's working. Uh, I wanna move on just a little bit here because we do have some questions from people in apartments. 
And so, you know, a couple of things here. Um, Philip, I know that, you know, you do a lot of work with the weatherization program and some of the multifamily buildings we work on, but someone's wondering, you know, Brad says, I live in a first floor apartment with apartments above. What kind of things can I do to help conserve energy in a first floor apartment? Okay. Well, if you, a lot of it's going to depend upon, um, are you paying for the heat or not? And in Madison and Dane County, a lot of times it'll vary. Uh, a lot of times in first floor apartments, um, you're seeing you have like electric heat or you have hydronic heat. Uh, two big differences in terms of your electric bill or your heating bill in the wintertime. So if um, you're doing things like that, you can look at, you know, window coverings and stuff like that. But um, probably what you want to focus on a lot is, is sort of your electrical load and how you can save some electricity. So a lot of times that's going to be making sure you have LED bulbs installed in your in your house in your first floor apartment and you also start looking at um uh so besides led bulbs making sure that you have uh looking at was it phantom loads that's what they call them so they do have power strips that are smart power strips that can turn things off when you're not using them so that's another way you can start looking at cutting down a little bit of that constant load of of your base load items to help save electricity uh, in terms of, of, of things like that. And it's also what I see a lot of in fourth floor apartments um, are the old inefficient wall mounted air conditioners or ones you mount into uh, a window. So making sure that you have an energy efficient, uh, high sear rated room air conditioner or window air conditioner is gonna help as well. So big problems I see is you know, a lot of these first floor apartments have just one air conditioner for a two bedroom apartment where there's no actual air conditioning in the units themselves. And I see people put in old rickety air conditioning units because that's all they can get. But if you have the ability to, to buy a newer one that's right sized and then also air seal around the window, it's gonna help you save some energy and take that window air conditioner out as soon as you don't need it anymore. So just some ways to help save electricity LED light bulbs are great things. A lot of times focus on energy as rebates. There's all sorts of things you can get from, from there in terms of uh, kits they can mail to you. So always check in with focus on energy. And then you can also, again, make sure the air conditioner's out and we're not eating anymore. So those are just some of the things you can do on the first floor. Philip, I like where your head's going too. You're trying to lead us into warmer temperatures and, <laughs> and get us there quicker. That's great. Laura, any follow-up on that in terms of ideas from MG&E about how people in apartments can help us uh, lower their energy costs and save energy? Well, yeah, the, the number one thing, if you are looking for an apartment in our territory is please don't forget that you can go onto our website and you can look up any address and you can see the high, low, and average bill. So the thing that's gonna save you the most money, no matter what floor your apartment on, is that you have an idea of how much it costs before you even assign that lease. Because especially if you have electric heat, um, which you'll find out real quick if you do in the first couple of cold months is it's too late now it's it's too late and electric heat can be expensive so the first thing you can do is do your homework be proactive find out who pays the heat find out if it's electric or natural gas and then get on our website and see how much that that high low and average was for the the year before and then philip made a really good point get on to focus on energy everyone um is eligible for once every three years for a free energy saving kit, which has LED bulbs in it. And, you know, changing over lighting, that's a, that's a huge one. Um, so, I mean, Philip hit on a lot of really good ones. Um, it's, it's harder in apartments because you're not buying your own appliances, but, um, <clears throat> you know, even if, even if, even if you don't have the best windows, you can always get out the, the plastic wrap. You can do that. Um, you know, any other weather stripping you can do yourself, but um, get your free energy saving kit from Focus on Energy and do your homework before you sign the lease. Laura Evans wondering about uh, electrical products you'd suggest using to help conserve energy too. Any, ah. Anything other outside of what Philip mentioned, the LED bulbs, uh, smart strips, things like that. Yeah, I mean, those smart strips are awesome. Um, you know, if you, you they're gonna, they're gonna control a panel of things. So right they're they're smart enough. The reason why it's just not like a regular uh, 
power strip is because it's called a smart strip for a reason. It's because, you know, it, it's going to let you know whether that TV is on or off. And if that TV is off, it's not going to send power to the DVD player or the cable box or the speaker bar or whatever else you've got there, because it knows you're not going to be using any of those things. And those things all use a little bit of energy, even if you think they're off. Um, and so the, the smart power strip is one, um, the LED lighting is another, I mean, don't be afraid to, I mean, MG&E provides free energy meters at the majority of the public libraries. So you can go, you check them out like a book, um, and you can plug any appliance into that meter and it's going to tell you what it's costing to run, uh, run that appliance. So even things like I forget too, sometimes like put your, put your computer on power safe mode. Like we don't even turn our computers off anymore because you know, what if we need it? You know, it gets got to be on. It's got to get out of that sleep mode. But like, make sure that you look to see if you're even setting your own computer on like a power a power mode. I mean, there are small small things that you can do on some some things like like that. But just being conscientious um, of what you have plugged in, uh, and um, and turning down your thermostat you know, uh, especially with electric heat, being careful. I was just going to ask about that because something that we've partnered on recently for weatherization customers was getting some Nest thermostats installed for them. And so Adam, is there, you know, is that another way? Is it a, is it a good enough benefit there from say installing a Nest or some type of smart thermostat uh, for someone in an apartment that it can help make a difference for them? Possibly. I mean, it all kind of depends on the living situation. Uh, the Nest thermostat, like you mentioned, is a learning thermostat. There's the Ecobee. There's a, there's a few other ones on the market nowadays. Um, but I would say Nest is one of the more widely known varieties. Um, it, it looks like a circular, old circular thermostat that you just rotate up and down to increase or decrease the temperature. And what it actually does, it kind of learns your usage patterns as you increase and decrease the temperature. And it actually starts to just do it on its own at some point. Um, it's challenging, especially this past year, where a lot of people are working from home. A lot of people are in virtual school from home. So the house is occupied all day. Uh, so people are tending to use the setback features less when the house is occupied continuously. Um, but, you know, it, it'll still do something for you. It'll still learn your patterns whatever they may be. So installing a Nest thermostat or a learning thermostat, sometimes they're called smart thermostats, um, though they're, they're a good idea. You know, the bottom line is they're a good idea. There's rebates available for people purchasing and installing those. Specifically for apartment apartments, you definitely would wanna run this past your landlord first um, if you're gonna consider doing something like that. Um, you know, we've gone down this rabbit hole of apartments and, you know, do, do you pay the heat? Does the landlord, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of what you can do in an apartment is specifically going to be related to your plug loads like we already talked about. So that's probably the biggest uh, energy usage area in, a, in an apartment building is gonna be like your plug load. So if entertainment equipment, gaming systems are huge users of electricity. Um, it, just going back to those old, you know, the old ways of just turn the light off when you leave the room, you know, something simple like that um, if it's, if it, if it's conscious, if it's on your mind, you're going to start doing it. You're going to start taking steps to reduce your energy usage. You know, if it's an afterthought and you never really think about it, you probably won't, you know, and it's probably not a concern. Um, I know mg &E has also been putting out a, a big ad campaign lately, um, saying heat the person, not the room where, you know, you can, you know, wear appropriate clothing for the weather, you know, don't lay around in your shorts and sandals. And when it's zero degrees out. Um, you know, put, put your sweater and sweatpants on, right? Um, so do that. Um, space heating blankets, uh, it, you know, maybe you can get by with uh, setting your thermostat down a few degrees if you, um, you know, if you use a, a, a heating blanket or a heating pad or something like that. Um, it, it's all good ways to reduce your usage. And when you start adding all these things together, it can usually make a noticeable impact in, in your utility bill and what you're paying each month. Yeah, it's interesting uh, what you just said was basically, you know, the stuff that in, if you, in my case, your dad used to yell at you about doing, do that and you can save some energy, right? That's kind of the point. 
rule of thumb to live by. Okay, um, let's move on to a couple of comfort things because there's some themes here. All right, some people talking about, uh, Gina says, we have a bedroom over the garage and it's always much colder than the rest of the house. The heat comes out of the vent pretty well, but the room is still colder than every other room. What can be done to make this room warmer? Who wants to tackle this one? Hands up. Philip, any ideas for us first? Yep, so we see this situation quite often in, in the city of Madison, Dane County. Uh, tuck under garages, a lot of times what we're talking about where you might have a side-by-side -side duplex or you're trying to have uh, your house on a little bit of a hill and you have that garage that comes underneath on the lower level and you've got your heated space above it, a bedroom typically or a couple of bedrooms. So a lot of times what you're seeing there is you've got a two by 10 cavity and you, a lot of times what we see time and time again, the builders just put in an R19 bat. So there's only half the available space has insulation. So that's why you only have maybe an R19 and your what's underneath there is gonna be really cold. In your attic, you might have an R50. So you've got a large area that is has minimal insulation, which you can potentially, again, add more insulation to. And our crews do that all the time in the weatherization program. And I've seen great results. We come back on the inspection and talk to the homeowner or renters, hey, how are the floors in your bedroom up there? Oh, there's such a big difference because we're able to add more insulation to that space and the board knew that you need a good qualified contractor because you're going to be drilling some holes in the ceiling of your garage, pumping insulation in, things like that to make sure that it is fully, truly insulated. But we want to make sure that, you know, there's also pitfalls because you do have heat ducts that run in there and cold air returns and electrical issues. So we want to make sure that someone who is, is qualified is trained to do that type of work. But the benefit can be substantial in terms of heat loss and more importantly, comfort for your, your feet and your toes. It can be about bathrooms, things like that. So we've had great experience with, with success and having that. Um, but you want, again, you want someone who can evaluate what the situation is. Well, don't say it's a little bit of insulation there. Well, how much is it? You know, they need to probably drill a hole and figure out how much insulation was, was installed in there. And quite often in the Madison area, in the homes, um, anything built really kind of before the year 2000, a lot of times it, there's not enough insulation in there. So it's a potential for the retrofit Insulation be basically tubed in and installed. But again, you want a qualified contractor and that makes a, a very great difference. Also, it also speaks to like other spots that could be have cold floors, like any thought that you might have a part of your house that is cantilevered over, like the front of the house or the back of the house. A lot of times you see that on um, the second floor of a lot of two story homes. In order to gain more square footage, they'll just bump it out one and a half to two feet on the front and the back. And a lot of times those aren't properly air sealed. And also a lot of times the insulation is just a real small little bat they just put in there. So those things you can find within for a camera and the blow order run at the same time. And you'll know whether or not it's, it's an area you need to address for the home for comfort issues. And there's obviously some agent savings as well. But again, have the tools and a qualified contractor that can go in there and really tell you the recommendations on, on what to expect. Other comments about tuck under garages and cantilevers, anybody? The only thing I wanna say about them is just that the duct runs, your heating runs are almost always in them. And particularly with uh, like Philip mentioned, the cantilevers, the, the place where the heat actually comes out of the register is always right there in the cantilever because it's always the furthest um, <clears throat> to the exterior wall. And so I always have wondered, like I'd love to put like a data logger in there and be like, what, how, I mean, most duct work is, is metal, right? Um, so I was, I was like, okay, you got this piece of metal sitting in this really cold area and then it's supposed to have the hot air run through it. And then so, so just to think, uh, it's just like all of it, you know, it's just people, like people, I just want people to remember that that poor room is trying to get heated and, and the air is coming through this really cold piece of duct work. So yes, getting it insulated is not only making that floor warmer, but it's protecting that duct work, which is, you know, trying to just trying to get heat to that room. So um, just something to remember. Adam, anything or did we get it all? No, I, I mean, they, they kind of hit on the high points. I mean, I guess a uh, couple things to consider if you're going to have that work done. Philip mentioned having a good qualified contractor who's familiar with doing this work is really important. Um, two, two things I want people to keep in mind if they're going to move forward to do this. Um, Laura mentioned the ductwork. So definitely make sure that the insulation 
is all underneath the duct and, you know, sort of warming up that whole duct assembly. So the air coming out of your registers is still nice and warm. So it's not cooling off as much as it's going through those, those building cavities. The other thing to keep in mind is if you have a bathroom or any other room that has plumbing or water lines running through those cavities, you definitely want to make sure the insulation is only below those, those water lines. Um, so, so they can stay warm enough um, from the, from the radiant heat and, or the, and the heat coming from your home. Uh, so you don't have frozen pipes if you bury those pipes in the insulation and actually can in effect cut off some of the heat that's keeping those pipes from freezing currently. Um, so just, you know, keep that in mind, um, map out where the water lines are, where the duct work is in those cavities and um, any good qualified insulation contractor is going to do just that. So it's really understanding, you know, every, everything with the house and that space, what might be uh, happening there and making sure that you're acting appropriately, like you said, because yeah, you want to make sure things like, like uh, water lines can get the heat to them. The other idea I had, you know, I don't know, just maybe for home builders that are building tuck under garages, maybe put a workout room above that garage instead of a bedroom. I mean, you know, you, you want that to be a little cooler anyway, right? So just a thought um, as we're building houses in the future. That's uh, Jason Hafman's building techniques and tips. Anyway, so it's such a such an important thing though because it, it's everywhere. Tuck under garages, cantilevers. We're at, people are always trying to add that little bit extra to the house. How many cantilevered spaces, and those can always be troublesome, cooling down rooms and, and causing comfort issues. Um, a question about furnace filters, Philip. I know you love furnace filters. Someone's wondering: Is it better to buy cheap furnace filters that you have to change every month, or to spend the money on those three month more expensive filters? What would you recommend? Uh, first thing is to make sure you're always double checking the filter, whether it's monthly, two months, three months, whatever it is. Um, it's a system. If you want to get a furnace filter you want to change every month, that's great. If you want to go one, uh, you have enough space where you get a six month filter, just remember to check it at six months and maybe even three months. Then one problem I see is the dirty filters, whether it's a, a small little one inch filter that maybe has some of the pleats in there. Uh, that's great, but you need to be checking it. Six month filters, they do collect more, uh, can typically filter out more contaminants. But again, if you're not checking that and it fills up and the filter starts to then start to collapse inside the furnace, then the air can just go around. I've seen that too often where people have this great idea, hey, I'm gonna get this great filter. It's gonna suck, filter out a whole bunch of stuff and then they don't change it and it collapses in and the stuff, the dirty air goes right around. Then it goes right up into your furnace, which then also has sort of filters which collects all that. So the next time you have a clean and tune on your furnace, not only do they got to take the filter out, they're going to have to clean some of the insides of the furnace and the heat exchangers, which it costs you even more money. So changing the furnace filter is all just about monitoring it. And a lot of times it is going to depend. Some people only have a one inch slot and other people you can have a three inch slot. We would sometimes put one inch and three inches in there. So number thing is do what you're comfortable with doing. And there's price is also consideration. Um, generally, if you can see through the filter, and the only thing it's going to catch is typically what we call a golf ball. If you can see through the filters, I would generally stay away from those. Those are on the dollar. They really don't do much except catch golf balls or socks. Things like that get in there, ducks. I mean, we see socks, things like that in there. So uh, I would recommend so that you cannot actually physically see through the filter and then figure out what kind of your price point is for which, how often you want to change those. And again, how much you have for, for pets and you have carpeting, do you have hardwood? How often does it get dirty? So uh, replacing the filter sooner is never a problem versus later on. So again, two cents in filters, there's lots of different kinds, but may see, make sure you have some system to remind yourself to check those. And you need to check those uh, when your air conditioning is running too, right? Correct, correct. It's not just furnace filter, think about it's your no. air handling air system filter. So making sure you're doing that. Okay, we are just about out of time. Thank you guys so much for everything. I'll give you a quick uh, go around if anybody's got any parting shots before we sign off. I will start with you, Laura. Anything that we uh, we want to make sure you stress that we didn't touch on? Stay warm. We're getting there. 
from the Project Dome crew, Adam or Philip, you guys have uh, anything else that you want to stress before we take off for today? Yeah, I just um, I, I just want to mention a couple of quick things. So number one, um, if any of the listeners out there are currently receiving energy assistance or if they're not aware of this program uh, and they're getting behind on their utility bills, they should definitely look into contacting their energy services provider in Madison. That's ESI. Um, you can look that up on the Google machine and get their information. Um, they provide some bill paying assistance. They make you, you know, if you're qualified for that, you're eligible for the weatherization, which where we could come out and actually perform some of the improvements on your home at either a free or subsidized rate. And then they also make you eligible for emergency heating system repair and replacement program, which is a huge benefit. Um, so if you find yourself in a no heat situation, uh, they can usually take care of that situation for you, which can be emergency life threatening situation, especially as we've seen the last couple of weeks. The other thing I want to mention is for, for anybody, uh, go to focusonenergy.com uh, in, in Wisconsin. You can select residential, and then there's a drop down on there for any number of the things we just discussed. They have information sheets uh, that explain a lot of this stuff further. Um, you can enter your zip code and see what sort of uh, services are available in your area, whether that's uh, finding an energy professional to perform an audit on your home or an HVAC company to come out and put a, an energy efficient furnace in. Um, there's all kinds of resources online, but I would probably recommend most people in Wisconsin start with focusonenergy.com. Jason, I'm gonna offer a teaser for the next one. We didn't get a chance to talk about furnace or boiler replacements and how you use a furnace analyzer to determine is it efficient my current furnace versus a new one. So I'm gonna leave that for next time. That sounds good, Philip. And Laura, I guess one quick thing before we go. Um, I know, so a lot of people still dealing with, with ramifications after COVID. If people are struggling to pay their bills, I know MG&E is trying to work with people. Can you give us a quick bit on that? Yeah, um, <clears throat> thanks. I, I did wanna come back to that. I don't know how much time we had, but I, I do, MG&E does want the community at large to, to rec realize that we know that people are struggling um, and uh, our, our hearts, hearts go out to our community. Um, MG&E also wants to know that our customers are there and the way we know that is by you communicating with us. And uh, if you are behind on your payments, that's okay, but we want to hear from you. We have a lot of different options for deferred payment um, payments and and so any any bit any bit that you can pay no matter how minimal is going to be a sign to us that you're there um, and we're working with customers meeting them where they're at uh, and so do reach out uh, and and know that um, we're doing everything we can to be as flexible as we can uh, and we're looking and we're looking to partner with people in the ways that they are able to. Yeah, I know there's information right on the website and a phone number people can call as well uh, if they're struggling with that information right at mgne.com. So thank you, Laura. Thank you, Adam and Philip, for your time today, your expertise, sharing some info about how to conserve energy and be more comfortable in our homes. Uh, winter is, we're getting past it. We're getting through it. But you guys are all great. Thank you for your time. Thank you for checking it out. More info to come at projecthomewi.org, mgne.com. Uh, we'll catch you again soon. Remember, we have a monthly podcast that we put out. And don't forget that we have a class tonight on bathroom renovations. If you're interested through the Verona Public Library, our master certified remodeler, Bob Wyro, will talk all about bathroom renovations if you're looking to